just want to share with you a passage here before I introduce you to this morning's message, but this is uh, something that you're probably familiar with. This is, uh, this is from uh, uh, James, the first chapter. It says, uh, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So if any of us lacks wisdom, we go to God, and uh, it says that he gives liberally, he doesn't upbraid, and it will be given to us. But then he goes on and he says something there, and this is something that I really want us to pay attention to. It says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man... What man? The man that wavereth, think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And I was just thinking today, uh, well, actually I was, I was meditating on this just uh, this week, is, is that faith without expectation is really not the faith that God wants us to have. It's, it's wavering, it's doubting. There has to be a degree of expectation. How many of you, when you go to God and pray for wisdom, expect to receive it? Because if you don't, you're not going to. And then you're going to wonder why you didn't get it. And he, I mean, he, he spells that out, that when we go to the Lord... We need to go in faith expecting. He's not, he's not going to withhold it. He's going to give us. He's going to give it to us liberally if we go to him in faith. But he that doesn't have faith, doesn't, don't let him think that he will receive anything, Scripture says, of the Lord. And, and faith without expectation isn't faith. And I think many times, and I, I, I was just reflecting on my own self, but I think many times we go to the Lord hoping and wishing and desiring, but we're not praying the prayer of faith. We're not praying a prayer of faith expecting Him to move, to answer. And, and James told us about it, right? So... Uh, Something for, for us to uh, take heed to. Going to the Lord with an expectation. Jesus even said, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. Right? Um, I want to share to you, with you today a passage of Scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We're not going to jump all over the place, so if you have it up there, you can look at it. It's Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Going to be reading a selection from Job, but you don't have to turn. You don't have to turn there. Philippians four four through nine. We live in a world that's filled with fear. We live in a world, that particularly right now, there's a whole lot of uh, of confusion and perplexity, and and in many times despair. How many of you agree with that? We see it going around. We see it happening in other nations, happening in our nation. There's uh, there's unrest. There's unrest, but it's not just political unrest, and it's not just social unrest, there's personal unrest. There's many of us today that are dealing with things in our own lives, uh, frustration and despair and confusion and many times depression and discouragement. But God, in His Word, has showed us how to deal with those things in a way that we can experience His peace. How many of you want God's peace? That inner serenity, that inner touch of God to experience those qualities that He has for us. And uh, I'm going to share this with you today. I believe that Paul, in his letter to Philipp the Philippians, um, has basically given us a, a, a formula. It's almost a recipe, in a sense, that when you put these things in your life, you will have God's peace. If you, if you put these things into your ingredients, you will have a chocolate cake. You know, if you put these ingredients in, there's the promise of God's peace. 
So I want to look at that today. And so um, let's just go there real quickly. And in fact, uh, it's up there. Can you go through nine? And uh, I don't know if it'll all fit on there. Okay. But uh, if you get it all, if you can get as much on there as you can, we can all read it together. Uh, this is last minute, so it's not his fault. <laughs> if you have a King James Version, you can read with me. If not, you can read, read what's up there on the board. Rejoice in the Lord alway, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he gives us this recipe of how to obtain or to experience God's peace. Uh, the first thing that he wants us to recognize is, is that we need to have faith, right? Faith is what combats fear, and, and faith means that we're not just willing to read, we're willing to apply, we're willing to appropriate, we're willing to receive, amen? And so uh, this is what I want us to experience today, this confidence in God's word being in true, the courage to put it into practice, and then to experience the contentment that he will bring us, okay? Um, how can we live this faith-filled life? What, what is this formula? What is this recipe that God says that if we put into play, we can experience this peace? Well, there's four steps that he gives us there in Philippians chapter 4, and I want to just highlight them. The first thing he says is to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And I wanted to uh, share, as I read that, I, I was reading this morning in my devotions from Job. And uh, this, uh, this <coughs> section or this passage jumped out. Um, and I just want to read it to you. It's start, starting in the first chapter of Job, verse 13. It says, there was a day when his sons, that's Job's sons, and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and only I am escaped to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell, you, tell thee. So all of a sudden, he, Job is a righteous man. He's living righteously. He's doing good things. And bad things are happening to him. The Sabians, it said, fell upon them. They, he, they uh, uh, slew his servants. And one man uh, escaped. And, uh, and then as, so as soon as that man came and told Job, then another man came to him and he said, fire from heaven fell. It's burned up all your sheep and the, and the servants and it's consumed them and I am the only one that escaped. And while he was yet speaking, someone else came and said the Chaldeans made out of three bands and they fell upon the camels and they've carried them away, and they've slain your servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell thee. These are a lot of bad news all, all at once, right? It's uh, the Sabians, fire from heaven, the Chaldeans, and, and it's, it's taking away everything that you own. And while he was yet speaking, there came another 
and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in your eldest brother's house, in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and it smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And so uh, this is bad news. How many of you would agree this is bad news? Okay, the Sabians, the Chaldeans, and enemies have come and they've taken away your belongings. Fire from heaven came down and it's consumed your sheep. And then, and then your son and your daughters are together in their eldest brother's house and a great wind comes, the house caves in, and everybody in the house is killed and I'm the only one left alive to come and tell you. And so Job, of course, rent his mantle. He tore his mantle. In fact, there, he was under despair. He shaved his head, which was a sign of mourning. And he fell down on the ground. And it doesn't say he fell down in the, he, on the ground and he complained and he criticized and was mad at God and told him just how unfair things were and how, and how life sucks and how he wants to just get off this world and go away because everything is miserable and God is just miserable. And, and, uh, and he was just going to complain and criticize. No, it said... He fell down on the ground and worshipped. And then it says, he, these were the words that he said unto God, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, I like verse 22, it says, In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, how does that fit in here? And, and as, as I was reflect, reading that this morning and, and realizing this is what I, I, I felt led to share with you today, I thought that there was a link here in rejoicing in the Lord that Paul told the Philippians. Paul demonstrated this in his own life, didn't he? In fact, wasn't it, e wasn't it even in a Philippian jail? <laughs> okay? Paul and Silas were, were apprehended, and they were taken, and they were put in this, uh, in this jail, and they were put in the dungeon, the lowest part of the jail. They were shackled, and it was a very dingy, dreary place. And here they are shackled there, and, and uh, instead of complaining, instead of criticizing, instead of crying out, instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, telling God how mad they were at him for allowing all this crap to fall upon them when they're trying to be righteous, you know what they did? They started to sing praises to God. They started to worship God in the midst of that jail cell. And it said the shackles fell off. A great earthquake came. They were totally set free from their bondage. The jailer, I'm, I'm condensing this a little bit, but the jailer and his family committed their lives to Jesus. They saw the power of whom Paul and Silas believed in, and he himself got saved in his family. Isn't that great? That's exciting. But you know, the key here is, the key here is, um, I see it in Paul's life and I see it in Job's life. The situations that they, they had experienced were, was going to rob them of their peace. And if their focus was on that situation and it was just focusing on their trials, focusing on all of their problems, they wouldn't be singing praises. They wouldn't be falling on the ground worshiping. They would, they would be complaining. They would be... They would be bitter. They would be, they would be telling God how mad they are. Or how in the world could you be a good God and allow these things to happen to me? And throwing criticisms at God and complaining at Him, wouldn't they? If their focus was on these things, but their focus was not on the bad things, but on the good God. And in spite of their situation, they rejoiced. Now I'm going to tell you, this is critical. And this is, this, is a, this is why this fits right in too. Terry, I'm glad what you shared. I was, I, I, you know, when I said ditto, I sincerely meant that because that thought came to me today that there was a spirit of worship in this place. 
True worship, people that were truly worshiping God, not singing psalms, people that were truly worshiping God. I, I, I really sense that. And I'll tell you what, probably some of you have got some issues. Lisa's got quite a few of them. But they, uh, but some of them. She has four. And the biggest one is sitting right next to her. No, the, 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 but we've got, we've got issues. We've got problems. We, we, we've come here today. Uh, all of us do. We've got financial issues. We've got physical problems. We've got emotional issues or social issues or, or we're going through difficult times. Many of us are. Many of us represent those positions and conditions. And if our focus was going to be on that, worship is not what we would want to do. You know, we, we'd want to stay home in bed with the covers over our head. We want, we, want to, we want to sit on our pity pot saying, woe is me, woe is me, look at all of these things that are happening to me. But you know what we did? Many of us did. We forgot about all of those things. All of the negative or bad things that are going on in our lives, and we focused on a good God. And we rejoiced. And you know what? God started to do something today. And I believe this just all fits together because God started to do something in your life today as we rejoiced, as we focused on him. Paul knows what he's talking about. He demonstrated in his life. He demonstrated even in, in Philippi when, when he was in prison. He, he praised God in the midst of his trials. Now Job at the same time, he heard all of these things. He heard all of these negative things that have happened. And I'll tell you, Job is written in such a way to bring us uh, uh, God's truth. It's, it's, it's considered a book, book of poetry within Scripture, but it, it portrays deep spiritual truths that God wants us to glean. And this, the main thing from the first chapter here is this, is, is that bad things can happen to good people. Bad things just don't happen to bad people. It rains on the just. When, when I read that it rains on the just and the unjust, I realize I'm going to get wet because I'm in one of those two categories. And so are you. It's, it rains. There's bad things that happen to good people. But that just doesn't, that doesn't change the fact that we serve a good God. And if we focus, if our focus, now this is this whole formula here, and this is just, this is ingredient number one, is to rejoice. And the only way that you can rejoice in the Lord is, is that you got to focus on the Lord and not on the negative things around you. Amen? Rejoice in the Lord. And again... I, I say rejoice. So this is emphatic. Rejoice. And I can almost, Paul saying, okay, here's the first step. If I was Paul saying this, I paraphrase. This is the first step of the formula. You need to rejoice. Now let, hey, listen to me. You need to rejoice. Again, again. You need to rejoice. You need to hear this. Rejoice. You need to rejoice. You need to rejoice. And, and, and uh, he's talking to people that might be thinking, well, what do I have to rejoice about? It's, it's rejoicing in the fact that you serve a good God. Rejoice. So step number one, or ingredient number one, is rejoice. Now the second thing that he says that we need to have in our lives to experiencing God's peace, it says, is a lifestyle of moderation. A lifestyle of moderation. Now, I, I really want to spell this out for you, and I really want you to hear this. Now, first of all, look at what it says there. It's in the fifth verse. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Too many of us today are given to excess in areas that are not important. In fact, we are majoring in the minors. And we are emphasizing things when there needs to be a moderation in our life. Now, how many of you want peace? Okay, a lot of us want peace. 
we need to emphasize the fact in our own lives that we need to live lives of moderation. Let your moderation be known to all men. I know of individuals that will sit around all day long and play video games. All day long and play video games. There's individuals that will spend all of their free time fishing in lakes or ponds. There's individuals today that will, you know, may, maybe be ri riding motorcycles all the time. Oh, <laughs> or it could, be, it, could, it could be anything. And I'm going to tell you this. What happens is, and what happens in my life, when I begin to look at myself, and you will look at yourself as well if you haven't already, you basically think, you know what, I wasted a lot of my day today. A lot of my life has been wasted in front of a TV screen playing video games. A lot of my life has been wasted watching, watching sports on television. A lot of my life has been wasted just riding a motorcycle around the country. A lot of my life has been wasted if it's not moderate. If it's not moderated so that I can emphasize the things that are important. There are people today that work and they do a great job at working and, and they let their whole family go to hell because of it. They forget about their family and their, and their responsibilities because they want to work. Right? Right? And they're not being moderate. They're not recognizing the fact that, yes, it's important to work, but not all the time. Your spouse needs you. Your children need you. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is essential. You need to grab this. I really believe out of all of the ingredients, this is, if you don't have this in, you're putting salt in instead of sugar. Okay? You have to learn to be moderate, balanced. Your life needs to be balanced. Amen? Amen? And it goes, it applies to anything that we have in our life. We live in a time of excess. You know, and whether it's, uh, you know, we can't talk to anybody because we got to check our Facebook. Or we're constantly on Facebook. Um, or we're constantly, uh, you know, we're constantly watching television or, 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 or just so excessive in areas that we're not experiencing moderation. And because of that, we don't have peace in our lives because our lives, it's just like anything else. When your life is out of balance, there, there's something that happens in you that, that, that keeps you uncomfortable, right? What, what do they tell you? Uh, sometimes you'll go in and uh, you'll just, you're, you're feel, feeling ill. And uh, maybe the doctor or the physician is going to tell you, well, you're, you know, you need to balance certain things out. You, you know, there's certain things that are out of balance in your physical system, in your physiology. How many of you ever heard that term? You're just out of balance and you need to balance this hormone out or this out. You need balance in your life to feel, to feel healthy. Well, you need balance in your life to have peace. And there needs to be moderation. If you're just given to excess, recognize there's times. And I'll tell you, there's people today that work seven days a week. You know what? God's system, you were not created to work seven days a week. If you want to work seven days a week, you go right ahead. Okay? But God did not create you to function working seven days a week. He created you to work six days a week and one day to rest. And some days we skip that day of rest because we're, we need to work. We need to make money. We need to, do that. we need to accomplish this task or accomplish that task. And we're not given to the moderation that God wants us to have. And I'll tell you what we're robbing. You might have a few extra dollars in your bank account, but you have a whole lot less peace in your life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The first ingredient is what? Rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in Him always, at all times, under, un, under all circumstances. That doesn't mean for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Amen? And then the second ingredient is learning moderation, balance, prioritization. 
getting your life to the point that it's balanced. And I'll, I'll tell you, when you get to that, we recognize there's a lot of individuals. This is, this is promoted in, in ministry circles uh, all the time. There are a whole lot of ministers whose children are, are, uh, ha have departed from the faith. There's marriages, uh, pastors' marriages that are failing. And many of these situations are because the, even that pastor and his focus for ministry at the church or ministry, uh, the specifics of that ministry has gotten so out of balance in his life that he's neglected his family. Anybody hearing this today? You want peace in your life. Rejoice in the Lord, but learn moderation. And then Paul goes on and he says there this. The third step, step is don't worry about the small stuff. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. And uh, that, that means don't worry about anything. That means don't be overcome with care about anything. It says, but in place of that, you need to pray to God with thanksgiving. Right? And so here's, here's the key. Paul's, Paul's telling them, you know, you're going to have things to worry about. Now, I'll tell you, st statist statistically, <laughs> statistically, what it, I, I think they say 85% of the things that you worry about will never happen anyways. 85% of the things that you worry about and, and the other 15 are not near as bad as what you've been thinking. Okay? And yet, people are so overwhelmed with worry. And we need to resist worry, right? So resist worry. And uh, I need to tell myself at that sometimes. I need, to, I need to tell Mark to quit worrying. Wait, and instead of saying, how am I going to get out of this? My phrase needs to be, I'm excited to see how God's going to get me out of this. Right? Instead of saying, I don't know, how, how am I going to pay this bill? I, I need to say, it's going to be exciting to see how God meets this need. Right? But I need to combat that because if you let those little, little worries, and that could be just little things initially, but you'll, it's the little foxes that spoil the, the vines. If you let those worries into your life, they will rob you of your peace. There is nothing here Nothing in your life that has ever been solved by you worrying about it. But it's done you a lot of damage. And Paul knows that. And he knows he's talking to a people whose peace has been robbed. And he's telling them this is the way that you have peace in your life. You know, you need to rejoice in the Lord. And you need to rejoice in Him always. And again, you need to rejoice. This is, this is so essential. You need to rejoice in the Lord. And then you need to be moderate. You need to have moderation in your life. Your life can't be unbalanced and you to have peace in your life. There needs, you need to have a moderate lifestyle. And then the third thing he says is what? Don't worry. Don't worry. And then the fourth, fourth thing, the fourth ingredient, and it's attached to that, he says, don't worry... Fourth thing he says, pray to God. Pray to God with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God with thanksgiving. Now, how do you commit those two together? How do you link those two together? Is the fact that you start thanking God for his answer already. In fact, you start thanking God for the fact that he is going to Meet that need, and he's going to supply for you the way that he sees fit. You know, I, I get to the point in my life where I just simply say, you know what, God? I do not know what is best for me. And so sometimes it's hard for me to even pray for what I want. Because I don't know if what I want is what is really going to be best for me. And so when I pray to God, I'm going to, I have to pray almost, God, help me to receive what you want me to receive. 
And I'm thankful, and we need, to be, we need to be thankful for God's desire to meet our need and to be with us. And as you begin to thank God, sharing these things, you know what? You, you might go to him along these lines, okay? There's a, there's a need on your life. Uh, um, you got to pay a bill. You just, you just had an a automobile um, fender bender or something, and it's taking you out of budget. And you begin to worry about it. And so you just say, no, I'm not going to worry about this. But I'm going to take this to God. And I'm going to say, God, I just had an accident, as you know. Uh, It's not according to my budget. And uh, I'm not going to worry about it, but I'm going to give it unto you. I'm going to ask for your assistance and help. And I thank you for it. I thank you that you hear me, and I thank you that you're going to intervene, and I thank you. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Now, let me, let, me, let me put it to you this way. Even if God doesn't do anything, you've just done something for you. <laughs> you've just put a formula in place that is going to do something in your life. Even if you end up junk in the car, are you, are you with me on this? Because he says there this. Look. Philippians 4, 7. The guarantee. This is a guaranteed result. And, and I'd like to change the to then. I want to put then before the. And then the peace of God. Or the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Everybody see that? Okay, so what have I done? Number one, I've rejoiced. Number two, I've, I've, I've decided I'm going to moderate my life. Number three, I'm not going to worry about the small stuff. When it, it's, it's going to be there. There's going to be plenty of you, enough to wor- worry about anytime you want to. Okay? But you've got to choose not to. And then number four, I'm going to pray to God linked with thanksgiving. I'm going to pray to God thanking Him. Thanking Him for His intervention, for His touch. Okay? All of those things. And then here is the result. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, is going to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But to have that peace of God that passes all understanding, you need to put these things into your life. Everybody understand that? Okay? All right. You're rejoicing well, but I don't don't really feel like you're getting this. (laughs) But I I really want you to get this, okay? This is essential. This is essential for your peace. I guarantee it, okay? I guarantee that if you put these principles into play in your life, you will experience peace in your life. Okay? I believe this as true and essential. The first thing you do, you can do it anytime, anywhere, is just begin to rejoice. Just to begin. I don't feel like rejoicing. Well, that's not the point. Okay? We're, 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 we're more mature than that. We're not governed by our feelings. Okay? I'm going to rejoice because I know it's the right thing to do. Right? I'm going to begin to rejoice, okay? And then I am going to look at my lifestyle and I'm going to ask myself, are there things that need to be moderated? Not being excessive in any ways. Let my moderation be not drunken. And I, I would say drunken would it apply not to just alcohol or drugs. I think it would apply to being drunken on the things of life, just being in, so indulgent and excessive in certain areas of your life that it's controlling your life. Instead of that, I'm going to be moderate. All right? So I'm looking at my life. I'm going to, I'm going to be moderate. And then I was driving in this morning, and my light, my light on my motorcycle is going on and off, sort of a... So there's something going on in my motorcycle. So that gives me something to worry about, right? No! No! You will not worry about that, Mark. Why? Why am I not going to worry about that? Because worry is just going to hurt me. It's going to harm me. And so what what I need to do when these little things come my way, 
as I need to pray, turn them over to God. God, you know the situation, you know the need, and I'm thankful, Lord, that you're there to help me, that you're there to meet it. And it may not be exactly like how I would answer, but I'm glad about that because you know more than me. <laughs> and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to thank you for that. And then you know what's going to come upon me? A peace that passes all understanding. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, Kenny, how can you rejoice? How can you do these things? How can you have this peace in your life when all these things are going on around you? I don't understand it. You can just look at them. Exactly. Because it's the peace that passes all understanding. It's not based on stimuli. It's not based on winning the lottery. It's not based on big bank accounts. It's based on what God has told us to do and our obedience to it. Right? Now, what's going to happen, and I, I guarantee you this is going to happen in your life, by the way. You start doing this, you're going to encounter peace. Now, what's going to happen, once you get it established, there's going to be something that tries to rob it. Almost immediately, it's going to try to rob it from you. And it's going to be, sometimes it's going to be uh, the, fork, the wind coming and blowing down your house and and, and uh, your family being hurt or, or uh, your, uh, your camels being stolen or your servants being killed. As a Job experience, sometimes it's very, very severe, whatever, but it's trying to rob you of your peace. But Paul goes on and he recognizes that. And so in Paul's discourse to the Philippians, not only does he tell them how to gain their peace, but how to maintain it. So how many of you not only want peace, but you want to maintain that peace in your life? Well, he, he goes on and he describes that. He says, brethren, this is what you need to do if you want to maintain that peace in your life. He says, think on things that are true. That's... <laughs> There's a whole lot of things that, you know, you're sitting around watching sci-fi films all day long or you're, 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 you're watching fantasies on television. You know, uh, just ask yourself how many hours of television you watch. Guess what? Most of what you watch isn't true. It's made up. And even some of the documentaries are absolutely false. But, you know, they're sitcoms, situation comedies or whatever. They're just, they're just uh, uh, it's just theater, so to speak. It's not a true-to-life situation. What we need to focus on are things that are true. What we need to focus on are things that are honest. What we need to focus on are things that are just. What we need to think, focus on are things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are of good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Think on these things. So Paul tells us, and, and he's telling us, I'll tell you what, you can hear the same thing going to a Tony Robbins seminar. Tony, I don't know what Tony Robbins' faith is like, but uh, his, his seminars aren't geared around the Scripture. They're not geared around uh, uh, promises from the Word of God. But you can go to Tony Robbins or you can go to other motivational speakers and you can pay $2,000 a seat and you can walk out of there after it's over and say, man, that's drastically changed my life. And basically, in essence, what they're going to tell you is this. Every single one of them is going to tell you this. You need to change the way you think. Before you can change the way that you behave, you need to change the way you think. Every single one of them, in essence, is going to tell you exactly that. There's not one that's, not going, that's going to emphasize the fact you need to change the way you are thinking. Right? We already have this. You don't have to go to a Tony Robbins seminar to get it. Paul has made it very, very clear here in Scripture, hasn't he? He says, if you want to have peace, you need to change the way you think. If you, how many, when's the last time that you sat around, and I, I'm just going to say this for an example, the last time you, you sat around and watched a horror movie and, and saw things that were true, honest, just, pure, lovely, <laughs> good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy. Pro probably very seldom. But there are things that you can mentally focus on that fit those categories. Amen? And as you do, 
it will have an effect. It will have an effect on your, not only your attitude, but your, your peace, your serenity. It will give that to you, and you will be able to maintain it. Because he promises that. Look at verse 9. He says, these things are those things which you have both learned, received, and heard, and seen in me. And, and Paul says, I, 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 I not only am telling you, these are things that I practice. And it's demonstrated, of course, that, you know, I, I've been in prison here. And then the God of peace shall what? Be with you. The God of peace. So we're told that then the peace of God that passes all understanding is going to keep our hearts and minds in verse 7. And then verse 9 when we're focusing on these things, the peace of God shall be with us. So for you to have, for you to have peace in your life, it's just people that say, you know what, I want to, I want to have a chocolate cake. And, uh, and it says that I'm going to need flour, it says I'm going to need chocolate, it, sa it says I'm going to need sugar, and it says I'm going to need uh, eggs. I don't know whatever else chocolate cakes <laughs> need. It's going to need these. Well, I, I'm going to look at that, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm willing to do the chocolate, but I, you know, I'm not going to do the sugar. And uh, you know, I'm not going to do the eggs. You know, and instead of the flour, I'm going to throw some baking soda in there. You know, or whatever. I mean, I'm just going to do it my way instead of the recipe's way. Because I can. Because I'm a free man. I can do whatever I want. So I'm going to do whatever I want because no one tells me what to do. You know, I'm not going to live in that Christian prison. I'm not going to live according to those, those, those biblical bond, the bondage of the Bible. I'm a free man. I'm going to do whatever I want. And then you're going to wonder why you're eating a big pile of disgusting slop. Right? Because you didn't follow simple directions that if you, if you just followed those simple directions, I guarantee you this. If you follow the directions and you follow the directions, you guys are going to get the same thing. Or pretty close to it. If you follow the, the, the recipe to the T, the recipe to the T, the recipe to the T, all of you are going to get a chocolate cake. But if one of you decides to change one ingredient, you're not going to get a chocolate cake. You might get something that looks like it, but not something that tastes like it. Right? We all know that, and we all say, yeah, that's common sense. Well, this is, common. This, is, this is a sense that's not so common. Because the same principles that we apply to recipes, the same principles that we apply to, to mathematical formulas that we say, no matter who does it, you're going to get the same results, it's going to work, we neglect when it comes to scriptural truth. And if you put these things into practice, you're going to have peace. But if you just say this, you know what? I want peace, but I'm going to worry about this. I know pastor and, and the Bible's told me not to worry about it, but man, I'm just going to sit down and worry. I just got so many things. He doesn't realize how many things are going on in my life, and I'm going to worry, and I'm going to worry, and then I'm going to sit here and complain that I don't have peace. Or, you know, I know he said to rejoice, but man, I just do not feel like rejoicing. And basically, you're removing the ingredients. You're wanting the chocolate cake, but you're removing the ingredients. You're doing it your own way instead of the biblical way. You do it this way, you're going to get peace. You're going to say, it's hard. It's, hard. it's not really hard. I mean, it's not hard to understand, and it's not hard to do. I mean, each one of these things is, you, you just make the decision and do it. I mean, you could do it right the second. But the key is, you have to have the willingness to submit to it. The willingness to submit to it. And uh, to do that, you need to fight a pride, a pride of life that's trying to pull you in a different direction. But it's not giving you the results that you want. I'd like to, when someone, someone comes up to me and they try to sell me drugs or they try to, they try to get me to drink or, or whatever, I want to look them in the eye and say, man, why would I do that? I'm already high. You know, I'm already there. Where you're trying to get, I'm already there. You know, you drink this, it's going to make you feel good. I already feel good. I'm already high. 
I, I already, I, I already a, a like life. Because I've, I put these things, I tell you, the people that, that need to do drugs and, and get drunk and do all these things, they're people that are missing an ingredient. And they're, try, they're trying to find it because they're unwilling to put into practice these ingredients because you put these ingredients into, into play in your life, you're going to experience joy. You're going to experience peace. These things are going to be in your life. Test it and see. Test it and see for yourself. Let's, let's, let's say a 30-day test. Let's say a seven-day test. Let's, let's do a one-day test. Just, 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 just test it. You're going to find out. That you start doing these things, all of a sudden your demeanor's going to be different. Your attitude's going to be different. You know, you're going to have a peace in your life because you're not, you're not overcome. You're an overcomer because you're doing it God's way. Instead of your way. It applies to so many things. Amen? Amen. Ingredient number one, quickly. Rejoice. Rejoice. Number two? Moderation. Moderation. Number three? No worries. worries. Number four? Pray Pray linked with thanksgiving, and then God's going to give us a peace that passes understanding. In other words, people are going to look at us and say, man, how do you have peace? Because if I was going through that same stuff you were going through, I wouldn't be peace. Well, it's not based on the stuff. You know, it's based on the fact that God has peace available to us in spite of the stuff. Then how do we maintain it? We choose what we're going to think about. He gives us several things that that will help our focus. But the bottom line is, you choose what you're going to think about. And as you focus on those things, I'll tell you, um, I've used this illustration before, but... And pardon the illustration, but it happens to me every single day. And uh, I get here to the office. I drive in. I leave, I leave my house somewhere around 4.15. And I get here to the office somewhere around however long it takes me to get here, 4.30 or something in the morning. And I'm fine all the way here until I get to the door. And then I have to pee so bad <laughs> that I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can make it to the bathroom. I'm fumbling with the lock. I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, how am I gonna how am I gonna make it? And you know what? You know what it has to do? It has to do with what I'm thinking about. As long as I know it's not available, I'm fine. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one on this. <laughs> All right? But the closer I get, okay? Even it's subconscious, I think, in most cases, but I, I you know what I've, I've, I've had to do to myself at times? I'd have to say, you're not that close. <laughs> 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 you know, or you, and, and, and you know, it, the intensity. There's, you know, and I know it's not something we commonly speak about, but, you know, the bottom line is, how many of you have got there and say, man, I just made it. I just made it. You know, any, any longer, my goodness, I wouldn't have made it. Guess what? You would have made it another hour <laughs> if it wasn't your mental focus, if it wasn't that close. The closer it gets, the more intense it becomes. So much of our physiolo- physiology is controlled by our mental focus. And that's just an illustration of it, but... This, this is so essential that you change what you think about, it will change you. But you have, to, you have to purposely do it. Take control of those thoughts. They say uh, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. Right? Now, that applies to thoughts. There's all kinds of thoughts that come your way, and they're triggered by all kinds of things. Smell. You smell something, pretty soon, pretty soon you're thinking of Grandma's house in 1962. You know, it, it, what, whatever. There's all kinds of things that trigger thoughts, right? What you can do is you can take, you can take control of the thoughts that you're going to focus on. You can't stop the thoughts from coming, but you can choose the thoughts that you're going to entertain and focus on. Amen?